Jesus Christ of Nazareth is alive. He is at the right hand of majesty on high, seated on the throne of grace. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this broadcast today, and we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been talking about the subject of prayer now for a number of weeks, and we're going to get back into it again today. We've talked about prayer that changes things. We've talked about the prayer of faith, the prayer of agreement, prayer of binding and loosing, prayer of intercession. We've talked about the prayer of faith by the elders. Man, we, you know, we've talked about prayer in a lot of different directions and a lot of different ways. And today, I want to talk to you uh, beginning today. It's going to take more than today to, to cover it. I want to talk to you about some very practical things about prayer. And this would apply to any field of prayer, whether you're in intercession or, or, or whatever the different kinds of prayer are that we've studied. And, and of course, you have to realize this too. Uh, it's very seldom that you would pray one specific kind of prayer like, the, uh, like just the prayer of intercession and really uh, not have all the other kinds of prayer involved in it because we know they do overlap and, they, and so forth. The reason we separated them like that was in order to study them and so we could be able to tell one from another and where to apply what kind of spiritual law and what the Word has to say about these different kinds of prayer. But what we're talking about now is praying for results, things that will help you, practical tips and, and things that Gloria and I have learned over the years that we've learned from other ministers of the gospel that have a lot more uh, time and experience than we've had. We learned from them and then we've walked by faith and lived by faith, lived our lives as closely as, as we know to do. We don't know everything. Well, the more we know, the more we find out how little we do know and how much more there is to learn and to find out in the spiritual things of God and find out from God about God and about prayer and all the other things of God. But we have learned a number of things that have brought results. We've made a lot of mistakes over the years. And uh, I want to share some practical things with you now uh, that will help you get results in prayer. Matthew chapter 22, and in the uh, 22nd verse, this is Jesus speaking. And, uh, I, you know, uh, excuse me, chapter 21, verse 22. Uh, if we're going to pay any attention to anybody about prayer, it ought to be Jesus. I mean, Jesus didn't say things, just, you know, tricky little sayings here and there that really don't mean a whole lot. I mean, every word he said is the word of God. The Bible said that God gave him his spirit without measure because he spoke the word of God. 21st chapter of Matthew, 22nd verse. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. I didn't say there's a good chance you might receive. Uh, you know, if everything works out right, well, you might receive. He said you shall receive. Of course, we're smart enough to realize that believing in that verse is this big. I mean, that's the, that's the hook that the hat's hung on where this verse is concerned. All things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Now let's look at the 11th chapter of Mark, because Mark records the wording of it just a little bit different. And uh, that's the reason, thank God, we have more than one uh, witness and more than one book in the Bible telling us the things that Jesus said and so forth, so we get the full picture of it. Mark 11, verse 24 Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Believe that you receive them when you pray. Now, I read those things because I want you to begin right now to develop the attitude that when I pray, I'm going to pray according to the Word of God. I'm going to pray according to God's will, which is His Word. And when I pray, I fully expect results. 
Now, first things first. Prayer that brings results and the development of an attitude of results. For instance, well, you know, brother, we'll pray, but now we never know if God's going to ask. Sometimes the answer is no. <laughs> I'll tell you, I've heard that junk. Well, what's the use of praying in the first place? You don't ever know whatever God's going to Who knows? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, let's go find out and let's develop an attitude of when I pray, God hears because I pray in the name of Jesus, I pray according to his words, and I expect results. In order to develop that attitude, however, you're going to have to come to this, uh, this thought and this idea and this, um, uh, this, this whole um, this whole mindset needs to de be developed in your or my thinking until it just, it's just second nature with us. That prayer that brings results must be based on the Word. Now, I've said that over and over. I've said it to you a number of times over and over and over again. But I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to keep saying it, and I'm going to keep saying it. I keep saying it to me, I keep saying it to you, I keep saying it to God, I keep saying it to the devil. Can't you see that's what Jesus, can't you see that's what's in Jesus' heart when Satan came up to him and, you know, started yakking at him about this and about that and putting a, a real set of temptations on Jesus. Jesus said, it is written, and again, it is written, it is written, and Satan just boogied right on out of there, man. I mean, there wasn't no way he could stay in the presence of that. It is written business. Well, at the time Jesus said that, he was out there in a, in a time of fasting and prayer. Now, prayer that brings results must. Underline the word must. Underline it in your mind. It must be based on the word. Now, before I get into that, I'm going to share some scriptures with you again. We've talked about it all during this prayer study, but I want to focus right on these scriptures. But now let me tell you something. This is just so heavy on my heart. Uh, just, I mean, just, just a few days ago, a good friend of mine, man I've known for over 30 years, went home to be with the Lord. And uh, something that his wife said, it just, uh, just ringing in my mind and in my consciousness. I've come into this so many times. I've seen it so many times. Jesus said, build your house on the rock. And when a storm comes, you won't be able to shake that house. But if you build your house on the sand. And then he, he said the storm would destroy it. So it wasn't the storm that was the problem. It was the foundation to your spiritual house. And when you, when you study that, those scriptures out, you'll find out what Jesus was talking about, the rock being the word. The Word of God, building solidly, consistently on the Word. Now, the problem and thing that, first of all, the thing she said was, it is terribly difficult. It is awfully hard to try to build your foundation after the storm has come. Another friend of mine that, that uh, had learned, he, his, one of his children had died, and, and, and he had done everything he knew how to do, and he just thought, God, is well, it's just God's will to kill my baby. But then after the, all that was over with, he, he got into the Word of God, got into some of our meetings, some other people's meetings, got studying the Bible, and realized that Satan had deceived him. Satan whipped him. Satan beat him at the game of life and stole a child from him. And then when the next child had a, they had a, uh, another tragedy happen in the family. I want you to know that dad stood up and walked right up in the devil's face, spit in his eye. You know what I mean by that terminology. And, and just put the word of God on the devil, drove him out of there, and God raised that boy up, and he's strong. And the daddy told me, now this is just another way to say the same thing. He said, Brother Copeland, you tell him wherever you go that if you don't put the Word of God in your spirit and in your mind constantly and consistently, in other words, on a steady day-by-day -day basis, when the tragedy comes, there's not going to be any Word in you to come out. There may be a lot of religion, a lot of ideas, but there's no, no Word strength fiber 
and faith to your prayers and so forth. And I, I, just, I, just have to, I just have to call you to mind to this right now, that the Apostle Paul said, those things which you've both learned and seen in me, do them. Do it. Quit being so lazy about it. Do it. Quit being so honorary about it. Well, I prayed four times, didn't get anything. Well, shut up. All that proves is you don't know what you're doing. It doesn't prove that God's against you or anything of the kind. It proves the devil's been lying to you. It proves you're so, you're, you're so spiritually soft that you're touchy and, and easily fretful. Well, you just get honest and a little hard on yourself and say, all right, smart Alec, you shut your mouth. There ain't nothing wrong with God. There ain't nothing wrong with faith. The, the Word of God still works. The only thing this proves is just my scriptural, spiritual ignorance and idiocy and what I need to do is get straightened out here and get right back down on my knees and you get out there and repent now. Well, why should I do that? There ain't nothing wrong. I mean, <laughs> people have actually said that. Well, I don't see no reason to spend all that time praying. There ain't anything wrong. Yeah, there is. Turn around and look at yourself. You don't think there's something wrong. Man, I'm telling you, you a mess going somewhere to happen. Amen. I mean, all the devil has to do is come in there and laugh at you a little bit, and you'll fall apart like a $2 watch. What I'm saying to you is, start now. Commit to God now. Don't wait till the tragedy comes, and then run out there in the middle of that storm and try to lay a foundation and put your house back right in the middle of a whirlwind that's blowing the, the whole countryside away, and there you go, just being blown with it. No, get on there now. If you've had that kind of attitude in the past, repent of it. God forgive you for it. Repent of it. Roll the care of that over on God and turn this thing around and be aware of God around you, being aware of your prayer life. My brother and sister, we are already over in a time and an era when if you don't develop your prayer life, you are not going to be successful in this day and hour. I'm talking about spiritually successful first. I'm talking about being successful in your mind and in your body and in your family and in your finances and in your church and every realm of life. If you don't get this thing down and get on the Word of God, then I can promise you right now what you've been coasting on for all these years, what you've put aside and neglected all these years, it's going to come to roost. And, it, it, and I'm telling you, it's a sad situation and a hard road to hoe when you're grasping for results right in the middle of a disaster. Now, prayer that brings results must be based on the Word. Let's look over at the fifth chapter of 1 John and uh, I, want, I want you to read a couple of scriptures over here in 1 John with me. And I want you to see, I want you to see exactly how this, is, how this is worded in 1 John 5. And look at this 14th verse. This is the confidence. Or you could put it like this. This, this is the faith foundation. This is what's underneath my faith. This is the confidence that we have in Him. It's talking about the Father in the name of Jesus. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Yeah, but I don't know what the will of God is. The will of God is in the New Testament. The will of God is in the Old Covenant. The will of God is. It isn't just in it. It is the Word of God. God doesn't will one thing and say another. That would be a lie, and it's impossible for God to lie. His Word is His will. And if you want to find out His will for you, then recognize that His will for you is Jesus. And what is in Jesus is as much for you as it was for any and everybody that's ever made Jesus Christ the Lord of, the, of their lives because Jesus was given to all that have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In short, His promises, all of them, are for you in the name of Jesus purchased by His shed blood. Now then, this is the confidence or the, uh, or the, the foundation to my faith that I have in Him that if I ask anything according to His will, He hears me. See, I put it in the first person, and you need to read it that way yourself. And if we know, 
That's positive. We're not guessing. This is not something, well, you never know. Yes, we do know. Yes, what do we know? We know that he hears us whatsoever we ask. We know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. That's what Mark was saying. This is John's way of saying, therefore, whatsoever thing you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Well, how do we believe that we receive? Well, the confidence that we have in him is that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And when we know that he hears us, we have the petitions that we desired of him. What does he hear? He hears the word. Hallelujah. And then you can come over into thanksgiving and praise. I know you heard me and I just rejoice and praise you for it. Now, since this is John that wrote this, let's look at the third chapter and the 22nd verse and see what he said there. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now that doesn't necessarily mean, well, you know, he answers my prayer because I fasted until I only weighed eight pounds. No, that didn't talking about. He's not talking about earning the results, doing the things that are pleasing in his sight. He just got through explaining is keeping his commandments. That's not referring to the Ten Commandments. Of course, that's involved, but that's not what that's referring to. It's referring to what he's already said in 1 John, that he has given us a commandment which is love one another even as God for Christ's sake has loved us to love one another even as Jesus loved us. That's what Jesus said, and you find that recorded in the Gospel of John. Well, he wrote 1 John, so we know it's, it's coming from the same, same person, anointed of the Holy Ghost, and that's what it's referring to, is walking in the love of God. Man, we're wa walking in the love of God, not allowing strife and confusion and all that into our lives. You remember what Peter said in, in First Peter, we read in the third chapter that living in strife in your household will hinder your prayers. All right. Now then, <laughs> go back over to the Gospel of John and you can see why it is so important to base your prayers, not just base them. I, I, I want to go a little bit further into this part of it. Like, look at the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John and let's read here the uh, seventh verse, if you abide. Now the word abide means to settle down in and make permanent residence, to settle down in and live. This is where you live. This is where to abide, and the word translated abide here, literally means to prepare and settle in as in a home. This is your home base. This is where you stay. This is where you live. This is where you're the center of where your life comes from. Okay? Now listen to this. If you settle down in me, and well, that's good, isn't it? If you settle down and center your life in me, and my word settles down and centers its life in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall. Not might, could be, some chance of. It shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. What fruit? Prayer fruit. The Father rejoices when you let His Word settle down in you so that the two of you are living your lives together, not just trying to get out of trouble, but living your life all the time so that when trouble comes, it just bounces off you. Praise God. It just bounces off you and the Father like it bounced off of Jesus when He turned around to Satan and said, It is written. And then He said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. Hallelujah. In other words, he's saying, I'm God over you. I have authority over you. Don't you tempt me. I mean, he broke his knees, man, with the word of God. Amen. Cut him right off where he stood. <laughs> Hallelujah. In other words, he didn't wait until it got into him. 
He's, he walked with God the Father in the Word of God so that when trouble came, he, he was already defensed against it. For instance, you remember one time he ministered to his own staff there. They were trying to minister to a guy with no result. And Jesus said, This kind cometh out but by prayer and fasting. And then he turned right around and cast the thing out. Well, then I want to know how come he didn't go fast and pray and then come back two or three days later and cast it out. Huh? He has already prayed up. He'd already fasted. He was already ready. He was already walking in it. They were spending so much time out running around and preaching and doing all these other good things. They weren't taking the time to pray and, uh, and to fellowship with God and develop their prayer life. And so they ran up against the devil and he just stood there and laughed at them. Now that, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, that should describe as well as anything I could say to you today of what I'm talking to you about. So now, prayer that brings results must be based on the Word of God. Now, Romans 12, 2 will tell you exactly how to prove the perfect will of God and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. I'll tell you, it's good to know that these things are available to us. So we start our prayer lives with the answer of the Word. Then we begin the application of faith. Once you go to the Word of God, I'm basing this thing on the Word. I lay the Word before my Heavenly Father. I lay it out there, and I lay it out there before the devil too. Mr. Devil, here it is right here. Now, if you're already in deep trouble, don't despair. Take hold of it right now. That's the reason I'm sharing these things with you. And tell the Lord. Be very frank with Him about it. Say, listen, I fouled up. Man, I messed this thing up so bad. And in the name of Jesus, help me. I, I'm, I'm coming towards you. I'm going to stay in you. I'm going to keep you in me. And I'm going to walk in your word. And keep the thing from getting all fouled up. And then begin the application of faith as if it was already done. Begin to praise God and worship God for it and see yourself with it. I mean, go to bed at night thinking about it. Oh, glory to God, it's so wonderful to be well. It's so wonderful to be healed. It's so wonderful in the morning to be able to get up and go down there to the breakfast table. I mean, you still, your old body still may be almost totally worthless to you, but you start seeing yourself with it instead of without it. You start just rejoicing. Oh, thank God. I tell you, it's so good to get to get up and go out in the yard and walk around and listen to the birds sing and to rejoice. And with a body that's not all broke up and, and full of pain and all that, just begin to rejoice in the Lord. What are you doing? Applying your faith and applying thanksgiving and praise where the devil get out of your way. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, I praise you today for this broadcast. We worship you in the word of the living God. And I'm asking you to reveal to every person in the sound of my voice, reveal these things to us, God. We're in a day and time, Lord, as you know better than all of us, where we have to hear from heaven just to make it. And we receive from you that we're not going to just make it, but we're going to make it in glory, and we're going to make it in power, and we're going to give Jesus all the praise and the honor and the glory for it. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the Word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the Spirit of the living God and the powerful name of Jesus in which we pray. And we, we ask you to reveal, to open the eyes of our understanding and flood our hearts with the light of the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. We're talking about praying for results, not just praying just to pray or not just praying just because that's what you're supposed to do or not waiting until disaster has broken on every hand before we ever begin to pray. I've had people actually say, well, I don't see no use doing all that praying. There ain't nothing going wrong. Well, that's like the fellow said, I don't see no use fixing the roof. It ain't raining. 
You know, then when it does rain, I can't get up there now, man. It's raining out there. <laughs> I mean, that's, how, you know, I mean, that's how ridiculous our little puny brains can be, right? Well, what we need to realize is we don't wait until disaster comes to develop your prayer life. I heard one man say it like this, don't wait to develop your faith until after you need it. Because if you wait till you need your faith to start developing it, then you're, you're going to be so far behind that it's next to impossible to get it done. Now, of course the miraculous power of God is available. Of course if you've, you're already in a mess, dear God, don't give up and don't despair. That's what this broadcast is all about. That's the reason we're in here to help you. That's the reason you need a powerful, faith-filled church. You don't need one of them old whining churches. Forgive me, but I'm telling you, time's running out on this planet. We ain't got a time to play social games and, and you know, uh, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you never know what God's going to do. That's probably God's will for you to die of the hoppy gondi or something. I mean, dear God, you don't need that kind of church. You need some place that just, boy, when something comes on, a brother or a sister, that whole church gets upset about it and gets on the devil's case. Boy, that's the kind of church you want to be a part of. Amen. Well, you find that kind of a church. You pray God will lead you and get you into that kind of a church. Amen. Where they can help you even in the middle of the storm. And then as you break out of that by the miraculous power of God, you don't just dump and, and stop your prayer life and everything else. Like one person told me, he said, we got off of the Word of God. I said, man, all, all that time we spent just fooling around out there, got to where we didn't pray, got to where we didn't pay any attention to the Bible, oh, we went to church now and then, yes, amen to everything, because we believe that, everything everybody was saying, we believe it, but we got lazy, and, and we got, you know, what I call spiritual shiftlessness, you know, <laughs> you just, you knew all that is true, but then, boy, I want you to know, when the disaster and the roof fell in, it is hard to build out of that and it's so much more, so much more blessed, so much better to walk in the things of God and walk in a fellowship with God so that the, the joy of the Lord is part of your life and all this other mess just bounces off your, your prayer life when it comes instead of, you, uh, instead of it getting hold of you. Now, I want us to go over to the book of Hebrews today. Yesterday we talked about prayer that brings results must be based on the Word of God. We read 1 John 5, 14 and 15. We read 1 John 3, 22 and then John 15, 7. Now you need to read all of those scriptures again and again. You need to read them every time you pray. You need to build them into your spirit. I like what Brother Hagin said. He said, just because you had eggs for breakfast 14 years ago don't mean you've had eggs. I mean, you know, you, ha you have to eat every day. You have to build into your body the vitamins and the minerals that come out of your food. And when you're, when you're in a place where your food's not any good, you have to add some supplement to that and to build and to feed this body every day. And don't tell me you ain't got time to feed on the Word of God because you're certainly faithful to your mouth. I mean, you are faithful to that table. Whoo, don't tell me I ain't got time. I've got to stop and eat. Well, be the same way about the Word of God. Amen. Take your little New Testament out of your pocket every time you sit down to eat and, and read 1 John 5. 14 and 15, oh, when we pray according to His will, we know He hears us. And I know when He hears me, I have the petitions that I desire to build it like taking that spiritual vitamins, brother, praise God, and just feed it into your spirit every day, every few minutes. Just pray and worship God. And while you're on the job, I mean, you don't have to just scream and holler it. While you're on the job, just stop a moment and say, Oh, Lord, I just want to bless you. Thank God I have a job. Thank God for your word. Uh, just bless God a little all day long. You, you won't really at that moment realize it, but you're building spiritual faith fiber into your spirit man and building up and building up and building up. You get to the point where every time Satan's storms comes on the scene, they don't do you like they used to. Praise God. Because you got heaven on the inside. Praise the Lord. Now then, Hebrews chapter 4. I want you to listen to this. The Word of God, this is the 12th verse. 
The Word of God is quick, or that's old English for alive. That's like pulling your fingernail down into the quick. Mm, boy's alive in there, wasn't it? That's what that's talking about. The Word of God is quick or alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thought and the intent of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in His sight. Now, it talked about the Word and then talked about Him. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, was not anything created, was created without Him or without the Word. So, He's saying, neither is there any creature that's not manifest in His sight, now, there's another way to say that. There's no creature. There's not anything, nowhere, anywhere, anytime, no way <laughs> that, that is not covered by the Word of God. You, you're a creature in the Word of God. It, the whole creation is covered by the Word of God, and there's not anything that's naked. I mean, there's not anything that is hidden from this Word, for all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us, are you and us? Yeah. Let us hold fast to our profession. All right, now hang on to that word there just for a moment because that's going to come alive here to you. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly to the throne. Throne means authority, brother. God has the authority. To the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now, third chapter, it says, Holy brethren, partakers of the heaven, the calling, consider the apostle or the sent one. That's what apostle means. And high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who's faithful to him that appointed him. Now that's what he was talking about. He said, seeing then that we have one that God sent to be the high priest of our profession. What? Our prayers and our confessions of faith and the application of our faith after we've prayed the prayer based on the Word of God, which is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword that covers everything, spirit, soul, body, everything. No creature on earth that's not covered by this. Hallelujah. Now, let me make this statement to you, and, this, and, and let's plug this in here. In we, we've prayed for results. Our attitude is when I pray, I get results. And I go after the results because I know God is in it with me. He's not against me in it. He's part of it. He's the, he is the part of it. Amen. Now then, I begin the application of faith. I believe that I receive it when I pray and I hold fast to my confession. Confession of what? Confession that I have God's mercy, I have His grace, I have His promise that I have already based the prayer on, I believe that I receive it, and I know that He hears me, and I'm holding on to my confession of faith. And this is the faith that we have in Him. See, where we applied that in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And then remember he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, if you live there, if you stay there and let my words live in you and come alive in you, ask what you will and it'll be done unto you. So here we're walking in faith after we've prayed this prayer. Now, now I said all that because I, I want you to see this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest passed into the heavens who is the high priest of what we have prayed and the words of our confession. He's been sent by God and He's faithful to see to it. You shall have whatsoever you say. Therefore, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. Now, what's your part of this? Walk in faith and walk in love. Don't allow strife to get into the middle of that. That has a separating effect. A separating, uh, um, I started to say effect and, and fact at the same time. A fact, that's pretty good, you know. <laughs> it has a separating effect 
and is a separating factor where our faith and so forth is concerned and opens the door to fear. Because Jesus is the author of our faith. Perfect love casteth out fear. Well, if you're not walking in love, guess what? You've got to be walking in something besides faith, and it's fear. Now, that'll break down your, the, the force of faith that God is using that's coming out of you and out of Him. He's in you. Now, let me make this statement to you. I said all that to get to say this to you. You act as though it was already done. You speak as though it is already done. James 2, 14 and also the 24th verse tells us to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. Now, if you have a pencil or piece of paper on you, I, write this down. To be afraid. What is afraid? Fear. What is fear? The absolute opposite to faith. It's a spiritual force that brings the opposite from what faith does. It'll cause your prayers to be hindered and be stopped and open the door for the devil to do to you what he's trying to do. Because faith activates Satan. Fear activates Satan the way faith activates God. To be afraid, to confess or act before it is actually seen or felt. I'm talking about the results to your prayer. To be afraid to confess I have it or to be afraid to act as though it's already done before you can see it, feel it, hear it, touch it, smell it or whatever. Or let's put it like this. Before it's revealed to the physical senses, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not yet revealed to the five physical sense world. It's over here in the spirit world. And we're walking in the spirit world. And in the spirit world where, where these things are eternal, where faith is eternal and all your needs are met there in that spirit world. And we're bridging the world of the spirit to the world of the natural where our needs are in process and we bring those answers and they're manifested over here in a well body, in a changed job, in a changed person, in a changed life, in being born again. All of that is, is crossing that bridge between the spirit realm where all these things are. God is a spirit. You are a spirit. And you've been born again. You're in His kingdom. The Bible said you have been translated. You've been delivered from the authority of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And we're building that bridge by prayer, by faith, by confession, and so forth, by our actions which, and by our praise, which keeps the keeps faith building and accomplishing that bridge even though the devil try to blow the bottom out from under it all the time. Just continue to walk looking not at those things which are seen, the Bible says, which are temporary or subject to change, but looking at those things which are eternal. I'm not looking at the sore on my hand. I'm not looking at my sore foot. I'm not looking at the disease. I'm not looking at the red ink in my bank book. I'm not looking at, at the, what everybody else is saying about me. I am looking to Jesus who is the author and the finisher of my faith and who is the high priest of my confession. What confession? Confession of faith. He's not the high priest of confession of fear and doubt and unbelief. Now back to my statement. Write this down. To be afraid, to confess that it's done, or to act as though it's done before is to doubt God's word. To be afraid is to doubt God's word. Now, if you hadn't gone to the word in the first place, then you ain't got anything to base your faith on. And every, uh, you know, every ill wind that blows down the road, well, I mean, I, I'm not healed. Look at that. I mean, I'm sick. I've had people say, how could I say I'm healed when I'm sick? Oh, I wouldn't want to say it, Brother Copeland. I believe I'd be lying about it. 
Well, see, that's because you don't have anything underneath your confession. If you go to the Word and it says, By His stripes ye were healed, and you go to the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy and find that all sickness and disease is under the curse, and over here it says in Galatians 3.13 that we have been redeemed from the curse by Christ Jesus and heirs according to the promise. Now I have God's Word as foundation to what I'm saying, and in the book of James it tells me very clearly that the word is easily to be entreated, it is gentle, and it is without hypocrisy. I'm not a hypocrite or a liar for saying that I'm healed. I am the healed. I belong to Jesus. Healing belongs to me. I am the healed. Satan's trying to take my health away from me. I come against that sickness and disease, not based on what I see or feel in my body, but based on who I am in Christ Jesus, who He is at the right hand of the Father on high. So I'm going to do all I can to thank Him and praise Him and thank Him that I am the healed. And I praise Him and thank Him and I act as much as I possibly can. I act as if it's already done. Now don't go do some dumb, stupid thing like pull your glasses off and you, you know you got about 2200 vision. And you pull your glasses off, well I'm acting, on the, I'm acting on the Word of God and go get in your car and try to go to work and kill 14 people on the freeway. I mean, I mean you know, there is such a thing as, as just being stupid. And don't do that. No, just praise God. Say, Lord, you know, the, my driver's license say, and, I, and I, I got my name on that driver's license says I have to wear this, but I just want to praise you as I put my glasses on. And I just I drive down the street. I want to worship you and praise you and thank you that the faith of God's working in me. And I believe I received 2020 vision. And I believe that I received my health. Praise God. And just go on and just rejoice and just praise God. Well, Brother Copeland, should I keep taking my medicine? Well, since you had to ask, you better keep taking it. <laughs> okay. All right. See, stopping your medicine is not going to impress God to the point where he just says, Whoa, I got to heal him. You missed the whole idea. You, he's already sent your sickness and disease on Jesus. He's already moved in. You're in the process of receiving. He's not in the process of healing. He's already done that. The process from his part's already done. The power of it is right there where you are. I mean, you're breathing air that's filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's in your receiving. It's not what you do without. It's what you do with. Are you listening to me now? All right. Act as though it's already done. Talk like it's already done. And far as everybody else is concerned, it don't make any of what they think about it. If they'll agree with you, think yeah, you get there just that much quicker. If they don't, don't pay attention to them. Talk to them and act around them like it's already done. If they want to keep talking about sickness and disease, well, just learn the vocabulary silence. When they come up to you and say, how do you feel? Well, what difference does it make how I feel anyway? Can you change it? Can you change how I feel? Well, then don't ask me such a stupid question. Yeah, I mean, oh, how do you feel? Well, not too good. You don't look like you put one foot in front of the Oh, no, I'm feeling worse than that. Oh, dear God, last night I didn't get a lick of sleep. I mean, y'all just playing with the devil. So, <laughs> forgive me, but I'm telling you the truth. Now, you know it, and I know it, so straighten up. So, anyhow, um, learn the vocabulary of silence. I told Jerry Savelle that about 20 years ago. He, he was struggling with something. said, Brother Coleman, how come the Lord ain't healing me? <laughs> I said, because of your big mouth. And he said, what? I said, because of your big stupid mouth. I said, you, you keep your big blab mouth shut if you can't say the word of God and come over to that place and develop the fact that it's already done. God has taken care of it. He laid it on Jesus. Now I'm receiving it. I'm receiving it. I said, Jerry, you need to learn the vocabulary of silence. When you're having difficulty with your confession, the Bible said don't lie against the truth. Keep your mouth shut. Just shut up about it. Don't say anything. How you feel, Brother Jerry? Uh, I, uh, Brother Kenneth, you didn't hear me, did you? How do you feel? Hallelujah. Boy, it's a great day, isn't it? Ah, uh, how you feel, Brother? Oh, I tell you, isn't it a good thing Jesus is alive? Hallelujah. If you can't say that, just shut up. Don't I have to answer? Who said you did? You will learn that when somebody starts that, 
you can turn around and say, well, I'll, let me tell you a little something. It don't make any difference how I feel. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is alive, and when he was on earth, he said, believe that you receive, and I believe that I receive. I don't ask Kenneth Copeland how he feels. I tell him how he feels. They bat their eyes at you like a frog in a hailstorm, brother. You know, they don't know what to do next. But just, just keep letting the word come out of you. Of course they think you're nuts. Of course they think you're squirrely. Of course they think you're an oddball. But it won't be long they think you're healed. Praise God. I mean, they see you out there some afternoon playing ball and thought you was at home sick, you know, with, with the <laughs> whatever. And there you out there playing ball. Dear God, how do you get I don't understand it. God always heals him. Don't ever heal me. I don't understand why. Because of your big black mouth. That's the reason why. Amen. All right. Well, now, I got to tell you this before we get off the air today. Refuse. Say it out loud. I refuse. Say it again. I refuse. If you're going to rebel, rebel against the devil. Rebel against sickness. Rebel against debt. Rebel against lying. Rebel against stealing. Rebel. Don't rebel against God. He's for you. He's not your problem. Refuse to allow doubt and fear to enter into your consciousness. Satan works in the area of the mental realm, suggestion, dreams, visions, all that junk. He'll do everything he can to get you offline because of a spiritual principle. The Bible said out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And my brother and sister, you, praise God, you are that establishing witness. God says you have it. The devil says you don't. God says you have it. Your body says you don't. God says you have it. Your bank book says you don't. God says you have it. What are you going to say? You are the witness in the middle. If you agree with God, you have it. If you agree with your body, you, the devil, and your bank book, then you don't have it. So you make up your mind, praise God, that you are the establishing witness. It's in your hands. Which way are you going to throw the ball? Praise God. Woo, glory. I get all excited, don't you? Don't you just love the word of God, man? I mean, we win, praise the Lord. Read the back of your book sometime. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you. I pray for this television audience right now. Everybody in the sound of my voice that they be made whole spirit and soul and body and financially and socially and all parts of their life be made well in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the name of God Almighty. Mm. Father, we praise you and thank you and we give you honor and glory and we ask you in the name of Jesus to reveal, open the eyes of our understanding, open the eyes of our consciousness and flood our hearts and minds with your word and yourself and how we can become more, how, how we can become more vital and more alive in our prayer life and in our time of worship and fellowship with you. We thank you for it, sir. We give you mighty praise and thanksgiving in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yesterday, <laughs> I did get excited on yesterday's broadcast about prayer and the things of God. I mean, man, I, you know, I get turned on. I, in fact, I stay turned on at just different levels of on for me. <laughs> Amen. Somebody said one time to Brother Oil Roberts, he was talking about praying and speaking with other tongues and and uh, he talked about the fact that he, he prays in tongues all the time and and somebody said you mean to tell me that you just turn God on and off anytime you get ready he said no ma'am I turn me on and off anytime I get ready he's always on praise God I just whew, yeah and yesterday I turned me on and God was already on and today we're going to turn ourselves on because God's already on, praise God. Seven steps are, are, actually it's turned into more than seven as we've gotten into this thing. The seven basic things that will help you bring results in your prayer life. Very 
practical things, conduct of life and the, and the way you should, uh, the way you should uh, live your daily life, what you do daily at home. Do you want me to tell you what the badge of spirituality is? It's not the way you act in church. Oh, everybody's very spiritual in church. Yeah, I say, man. Everybody, I mean, everybody, you know, oh, yes, brother. Oh, yes, such a wonderful message, brother. No, that ain't, I mean, you don't tell how spiritual somebody is by the way they act in church. You tell how spiritual they are by the way they act at home. Amen. <laughs> That's when you find out whether, whether somebody lives a life of spirituality or not. Amen. Oh, isn't it? <laughs> Like one guy said, sad but true, sad but true. Well, that's sad but true. <laughs> Absolutely the truth. We talked about prayer that brings results must be based on the Word. Then we talked about uh, once the prayer is prayed and the Word of God has been laid on the altar of faith and you said, Amen, so be it, and you begin to praise and worship God and thank Him that it's done. Then we begin the application of faith. You begin those things of believing that you receive when you pray. Our confession that it is done. Our actions that it is done. We act as though it's done. We receive when we pray, holding fast to our confession. That's where we were yesterday talking about the fact that uh, in Hebrews 4, 16, you know, come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? Seeing we have a great high priest passed into the heavens, who is the apostle or the one sent of God to be our high priest of our confession. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, yesterday we talked about refusing to allow doubt and fear to enter into your consciousness. Man, this stuff can come from all kinds of different places. It's a vital thing. Vitally, it is awesomely important to protect what comes in your ears and what comes into your eyes, particularly when you're walking and living by faith and your body is screaming, we're not healed. There's no use you acting like that. No use you talking like that. And your old unbelieving friends are talking like that. Ah, like one fellow said, you know, somebody ruined him. What do you mean somebody ruined Well, they got to running around with Copeland. Oh, yeah, and they're just running around all over the country acting like little Jesuses. Well, I mean, he paid me the biggest compliment he could have ever paid me and didn't realize it. He thought he was putting me down. No. This, we're acting by faith. Some people say, well, they think they're God. No, we don't think we're God. No, we know who we are. We're children of God. And in this earth, we're the agents of God, representatives and witnesses of God. And our confession is of His Word. And our confession is that my God can do all things. Nothing is impossible to my God. And all, thing, all things are possible to him that believeth. And I'm a believer. Therefore, all things are possible unto me. So you see, you have to protect your thought life. And, and you have to do it. Bless God. God Almighty, do it. Don't just play around about it. Don't just talk about it. Do it. Do it in the nighttime. Do it in the daytime. Do it. Stand before God in faith. Do these things. Begin to be a person of faith. I don't care what you were yesterday. Lay hold of it. Control your mind. You control your thinking. Turn off the noise of the world. You don't have to have your radio blaring at you all day long every time you go down the street. You don't have to have noise at you all day long. Some of you cannot, you, you think you cannot exist during the day without the radio going, without this going, without that going. Hey, if you're going to listen to something like that, put the Word of God on those things and turn it on and listen to it. You can learn that you don't have to have something blaring at your mind all the time. You need to learn how to listen to God. You need to learn how to turn to the voice of God that's on the inside of you. Do you know that's the reason used to in, in years past when women stayed at home all the time and they, they were not out there, you know, all hung up out there in the world and all that traffic out there. It seemed like women's intuition was absolutely 
a hundred times stronger than men. They knew what was right more than men did. Why? Well, back before the days of television and radio and all that going on, and, and uh, once the children were all gone and a woman was there at home and she's standing there over that iron and board or she's doing something, you know, she's in her thoughts and she's praying and she's listening to God and she's listening to her spirit. And as she listened to her spirit, I mean, even though maybe she didn't know that she was doing that, she began to listen to these, these areas of her that knew more than just her brain did. Now, I'm not saying, oh, the women ought not work and all that. I mean, you're going to have to settle that with God. So, but what I am saying, you are going to have to take the time to be quiet before God. Or sometime, you're going to have to do it on purpose, and you really need to turn off all of that worldly and chatter and noise that's coming at you and turn on the things of God and listen to the things of God. Control your mind with the Word and dwell in the answers instead of on the problems and the pains and the things that say you don't have it. Spend your time and control your time, your mind. Do whatever you have to do to spend time in prayer and be, begin a barrage of the answers because in God's Word lies the power to bring God's Word to pass. Now let me read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 3. For though we walk, or no, in other words, we live in this flesh world and this physical sense surrounded world, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. In other words, our warfare and our victory is not in this flesh world, it's in the spirit world. Through the world of the spirit we can control our personal environment, and our thought life. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not flesh. They're not physical weapons. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now here's what you have to do. Casting down imaginations. The Greek uh, reference over here in the middle of my Bible said, or reasonings. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God or against the Word of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? Hear what he's saying there? He's saying any thought that comes to your mind and says, you're not going to get your healing. I mean, after all, you ain't been on a 40-day fast. After all, you know who you are. You're ugly. You're no good. You're unworthy. And then you go somewhere and somebody says, yes, we're all unworthy. And then someone says, healing is not for today. And then someone says, ah, you ain't running around with that, those idiots that believe in here. You want them faith healers? Just like a, like, like the whole atmosphere it is full of doubt bugs, you know, just everywhere. Say, so, well, brother, I don't know whether I can do this or not. Yes, you can. Here is the process outlined in Proverbs 4, verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Now, are the weapons of our warfare which are not carnal? God's words, attend to them, means to put that to your attention or put it first place. I have to attend to this before I do anything else. This is primary. I have to do this before I can do that. Somebody says, let's go, um, you know, let, let's go to the ball game. I can't go to the ball game. Why can't you go to the ball game? Because I have to attend to this over here first. I gave those folks my word. I got to do this before I can go to the ball game or anything else. He said, attend to my word. Put, do it specifically on purpose and do it right now. I mean settle it with God forever, settle it with the devil forever, and settle it with yourself forever. You settle it that God's Word is first place and final authority in your life. I am going to think His thoughts which are higher than my thoughts. Isaiah chapter 55. Now, my son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. 
Now, you have to work at that. I mean, you have to work at that. Pay attention to what God is saying and do it. Don't mess with it. Do it. Well, I'm trying. Well, shut up that trying and do it. We're not trying to be faith people. We are faith people. Now go be one. Amen. So, this is me, this is my life, and this is forever. I settle it with God. Your word is first place. Whatever your word says I am, I am. Whatever your word says that I can do with the power of your Holy Ghost, I can do it. He's my helper. And I'll go wherever it says go, and so forth and so on. Now, incline your ear unto the word of God. When it says by his stripes ye were healed, instead of saying, well, I sure wish I was, but you know how bad I got, you know, my lumbago disappearing me. No, no, incline your ear to God's sayings instead of inclining your ear to the pain. Now, I know, brother, I mean, this sometimes, man, this is hard. The Bible says in, in the Word of God to consider Jesus. Consider him the high priest. Consider him who who took such shame on himself in order to set us free. Consider him. Get your mind over on him. Settle your mind over on him and lock in there on it when pain becomes so terrible. And when you're standing against sickness and disease, lock in on Jesus. See him on the cross. See him on the throne. See the wounds on his back. Watch in your spirit. Watch him. Watch him over and again. Read the crucifixion. Read the resurrection. Go to the Word that gives it to you. Think about it and think about it and think about it. And Every time a word of doubt or unbelief or unworthiness, anything that is against the results that you've set out to get in prayer, stop it right then. No, no, you don't come into my thought life. No, you don't come into my consciousness. No, I refuse, a, the, I refuse that mental picture and that mental image of my child being on drugs. I refuse that in the name of Jesus and I refuse to feed it into his mind too. I'm, I'm, my, my children are taught of the Lord and powerful in the Lord and great shall be the peace of my children, Isaiah 54. Praise God. So then, now notice how he says, do it. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Keep them there. Man, you have to do this on purpose. You may be incarcerated somewhere. You may be in the county jail somewhere. You may be in federal penitentiary. You may be in a state penitentiary somewhere. You may be hid out somewhere from somebody trying to keep from going to the penitentiary. I don't know who you are or where you are, but I'm telling you right now, this is what you better do, whoever you are. I don't care how tough the situation is. I don't care how hard the situation is. I don't care how overbearing the situation is. I don't care how horrible it is. I know men that have done this right in the middle of awesome, terrible war and combat. I know a man that did this. I mean, he, he, got, he kept the word of God in front of him. He was in a, in a prisoner of war camp. And the bombers came over. And they're bombing this place. They're bombing it. They, didn't, they don't know that there's prisoners that it captured and put into this place. And there was a hospital complex there. He was in that hospital. And, and there was another guy in there. He hung on to the word of God. And the bombs started falling. And they jumped out of bed and fell under the bed. And they both fell under the same bed. And if I flew underneath that bed, and this one guy had his Bible, and he's shouting the 91st Psalm, God is my buckler, he's my strength. I will say to him, he's my deliverer. And there'll be a thousand on one side and 10,000 on the other side. He's locked into it. There's other guys screaming and cursing, hollering, we're going to die, we're going to die. Oh, and these guys are hollering the 91st Psalm, and the other one's hollering the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> <laughs> and right in the middle of it. And after everything cleared, all the airplanes is gone, the building's flat. I mean flat. People dead, bodies everywhere. Except these two. Their little old bed. He's sitting out in the middle of this rubble. There ain't no roof. There ain't no walls. Everybody else is dead. The guards are dead. The soldiers are dead. The, the patients are dead. Except these two sitting under that one little hospital bed hollering the 91st Psalm and the 23rd Psalm. 
locked in to the things of God. Dear Lord in heaven, when are we ever going to wake up to the power and what happens when God and man hook together on His Word and minds begin to flow with God's mind instead of crosswise of it? I can stand here for the next two weeks and tell you one thing right after another, after another, after another, every kind of a disaster you can think of that my own household has been delivered of, things that I'm personally aware of and have seen it time and time and time and time again. Now then, notice this. He tells you exactly how to do it. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Talking about the word of God. For their life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence. Be diligent to protect your spirit from doubt and unbelief and reasonings and all this stuff like Paul said in Corinthians that sets itself and exalts itself against the Word of God. Well, you don't think you're going to get healed this time. Well, you don't think that silly faith stuff really works, do you? Well, you don't think... I'm talking about your own thoughts. I mean, you wake up in the middle of the night laying there in a cold sweat. Well, you're not going to get your healing. You're not going to get your healing. Bust him right in the head. Get up right then. Don't even try to go back to sleep. Get up right there and say, Mr. Devil, you ain't doing me that way in the name of Jesus. I take the word of the living God and I come against you. What are you doing? Doing the same thing he was doing. The only thing, your words have power and his didn't. Hallelujah. Then he says... For these words that you keep before your eyes and keep in the midst of your heart, these words are life to those that find them. They're health to all their flesh. Keep your heart or protect your spirit with all diligence for out of it are the forces of life. Put away from you a disobedient mouth and perverse lips far from you and keep your eyes looking right on and your eyelids look straight before you or don't be distracted by the world from the Word of God. and Walk in it and stay in it and stay in it and stay in it. Oh, I mean, you're liable to go for days and days where it looks like there's just not anything working and you just still stayed hooked, just still stay in it. You're still testifying to what you believe. You're still standing on the Word of God. Then you begin to get involved helping somebody else like your deal's already done. And it just, I mean, you may still be in it and still be in it, but you will begin to notice in your own heart and in your own eyes what used to look like such a monster of a problem, what used to look like such a gigantic, overwhelming fortress that the devil's built up before me, I'll never get out of this, dear God. You begin to notice it don't look this big, bad, and ugly as it used to. Hallelujah. And you think people are saying the same old ugly stuff about you, but all of a sudden, I don't know, just don't get the word... It, it just don't mean too much. I mean, after all, I've put God first in my life now, and the stuff he says about me is good. You know, he, the Bible said he's not ashamed to call me his brother. Well, if he's not ashamed to call me brother, I don't care what them other guys call me. What do I care? I mean, what do I care what they do to me and say to me? I've become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody said, uh, what nationality are you, heaven? What? <laughs> yeah. I've become the righteousness of God. My nationality is now is not based on my earthly culture. It's not based on the color of my skin. It's not based from where my daddy come from. Not based from where my mama come from. It's based on the fact that Jesus is now my joint heir and I'm an heir of God. So since I've been made the righteousness of God, it don't make any difference what the world says about me or tries to do to me. They can't keep me out of the things that God has designed for me and His Word promises me. I don't care whether white folks like it or not. I don't care whether black folks like it or not. I don't care whether red folks like it or not or brown folks like it or not or yellow folks like it or not. I don't care what they try to keep me in there, keep me out of. When I'm walking in the things of God, I have found out that Praise God, I'm the righteousness of God, and I have the rights of God, and I fear not what men can do to me. Praise the Lord, I'm a free man. I am free in Jesus. Praise the name of the living God. And now, as, as you testify to what you believe, your testimony to what 
you have received from the blood redemption of Jesus Christ and you have a right to all that Jesus can do. Go about telling what Jesus has done. Go about telling that Jesus went to the cross. Go about telling what a wonderful Savior He is. Go about talking about it all the time. Why, Brother Copeland, it'll just turn them folks off. Well, I'll tell you what, it'll turn some of them on too, praise God. And you begin to win souls. And all of a sudden, your needs begin to dissolve in the middle of all of that. If you need healing, go pray for other folks that need healing. If you need money, give money. In your mind, see yourself becoming a giver. See yourself a giver of money, a giver of good, a giver of life. Become a giver and not just a getter. Become these things in your own consciousness by placing God's Word first place in your life and continuing the application of faith far and long after you have prayed and rolled the care of it over on God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Father, I pray for this television audience that they be made whole, spirit and soul and body, that every need they have come to a place where it bows its knee to the name of Jesus and that their finances be straightened out, the jobs they need become apparent and that they come together with those jobs and their businesses flourish and the power of the living God and where people, Lord, I want people to come around all, all of my partners and all of us in this thing and say, where are they getting it? Where are they getting it? How do they do it? And all of us can say, my God meets my needs according to His riches and glory. <laughs> Hallelujah! Mm. I believe one of the most powerful, um, one of the one of the the top-notch Bible revelations of my life that that has brought results. And when I'm talking about results, I'm talking about that that mysterious time in everybody's life, even particularly every serious Christian's life, when you've prayed, and from that time until this thing has come to completion and it's done uh, in the natural and, and you go on to other things. That period of time in there, particularly when you really up against it, man, and something that'll really be a weapon in your hand to walk in that area. And I want to share it with you today. I'll tell you, it's, it's been one of the strongest, most powerful things in my life now for 20 plus years. Let's see. Um, yeah, 20, 23 years ago that I found out about, well, 20, about 22 and a half years ago at this moment that I found out about this and I've used it ever since and it's good. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for it. I pray in the name of Jesus and put this broadcast into your hands and put the the audience into your hands, and I thank you for your capable leadership in the name of Jesus. Amen. We've been talking about prayer that brings results, and you remember we, we've discussed the fact that uh, we, we must come to a place where we refuse, absolutely refuse. We were talking about this yesterday and the day before both in controlling our minds with the Word of God. We absolutely refuse to allow thoughts of doubt and unbelief to enter into our consciousness. I just, man, I'm not going to have it. Now that's all there is to it. But you have to come to a place where you're, you answer that thought of doubt, that, that thought of unbelief, the stuff that's going on around you. You have to learn to close your ears to it, and you have to learn how to do it immediately. You don't entertain that for three days and say, well, you know, I really guess I ought to get on my faith here. Oh, what's the use in here? I mean, it's, it's always been amazing to me. I mean, I've had the devil pull this on me so many times until I finally woke up, you know, and, and fought back at him. When you'd, you'd slip or you'd do something wrong and say, well, you know, I might as well just go back to drinking. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean man, no. I mean, that doesn't call for more sin. That ain't going to fix anything, dear God. I mean, 
You know, you need to learn that even your sin is none of the devil's business. It's Jesus' business. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. He's your Deliverer. He's also your advocate with the Father. When we sin, the Bible says to go to Him and confess it, and He's faithful and just not only to forgive you, but cleanse you of all unrighteousness. We read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to read this fifth verse. Well, no, let's back up to the third verse again. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. Our warfare is with spiritual weapons, not natural carnal weapons. And so we, we walk and we, we, even though we have this flesh world to deal with, that's what our prayer lies. That's the bridge we're building between heaven and earth, between God and man, between His Spirit and your spirit. By faith is we're bri- building this bridge to change this physical, natural world. So physical, natural things won't change it. We have to reach into the, into the spirit realm where the governing forces are. Now, weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, reasonings, thoughts, ideas that are against you, you see, things that are crosswise of you. I mean, I don't care if somebody preaches them from a pulpit. Somebody stands up and said, well, now you might not get your healing. I'm not going to hear that. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm going to be ugly about it, but I just get out of earshot of that. I'm not going, I'm not going to listen. I, I just, I'm not going to hear that. Well, it might not be God's will. Well, then he shouldn't have sent Jesus to the cross then because I accepted him as my Savior and he's my Lord. He bore my sickness and carried my diseases. See, this is, this, this is my thought pattern. This is my thought life. And as we read from Proverbs 4 yesterday, keep the word before your eyes. Keep it in the midst of your heart. Put away from you a disobedient mouth and perverse lips and hold on to the word of God for it's life to those that find it and it's health to all their flesh. Amen. Now, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, the word Christ is a Greek word that means the anointed. So, let's notice what it says now. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of the anointed one. Into obedience to Jesus, the one that is anointed of God, or in other words, your Savior. Bring it into obedience to the anointed one. He is anointed to bring this to pass if you will bring your thought life into trail with the Word of God. And thoughts and ideas, dreams, visions, even if an angel, the Apostle Paul said, come telling you anything that's not what this book says or crosswise of these promises, then let him be accursed. In other words, God and his Word are primary regardless of who, what, if, when, where, why, whatever is crosswise of it, you come into line and bring your thought life into line with this. Now, that's easier said than done, right? (laughs) Yeah, you know it is. Now, Philippians 4, now that said, cast out thoughts, bring those thoughts into obedience. Now, Philippians 4 said, don't be anxious about anything. Now, that's where the temptation is. There's a temptation to worry about it, temptation to fret about it. And and this is where we're going to single up on this today. I want to show you how, literally, step by step, how to do this. How to keep from worrying. How to control that temptation to worry and to fret and to be anxious. He said, don't do it. But in everything, in everything, there's not anything that qualifies as far as God is concerned for you to worry about. Oh, yeah, Brother Copeland, I know we shouldn't worry, but, you know, here it comes. Here comes the unbelief. I mean, every time somebody said, well, you know, I know, we but here it comes, brother. Just go, you know, go, go get your raincoat and put it on because here comes a flood. A doubt, unbelief, every idea in the world except what God's Word said. Yeah, I know the Bible says that, but here it comes. <laughs> you know, here it all comes. No, there's a way to get rid of that. Oh, yeah, Brother Copeland, you just, you just don't know how. You just, you, 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 you just don't understand. I know it, but God does. Amen. 
Now watch. Everything in prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. That's, that's the key. With praise and thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God and the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. There is a way to call on this peace and cause that peace to think, take over your mind, take over your spirit, take over your whole consciousness, and people look at you and say, you know, that's probably either the stupidest fella in the whole world because he is, I mean, <laughs> he's, he don't understand the problem, okay? Either that or he's the most irresponsible fella in the world. I mean, all this stuff is just going to hell in a handbasket around him, and he's still got a smile on his face. I mean, he looks like he don't even know it's happening. No, I'm not being irresponsible. I'm being more responsible. Irresponsibility is to worry and fret about something that the worrying and fretting won't do anything about it except destroy your faith and stop the... Uh, the changing of it start with. That's what's irresponsible, but the world doesn't look at it that way. And besides that, you're not answerable to the world anyway. You're answerable to God, and that, that's, that's, where you, that's where your answers lie. Now, there's a way to do this, and the responsibility is to roll the care of it over on God. Now, let's go over here to 1 Peter chapter 5. And I'll show you this. I'm telling you, this, uh, <laughs> there's not enough money in all the world for me to ever pay God back for putting this in the Word. Because this, I'll tell you, this has gotten me out of more tight spots, more junky deals, more problems, more heartache than, than anything else other than when I made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life and, and began to realize that his word works. Now listen to what he said. He said, You younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to one another. Now listen. And be clothed with humility. Now if you stopped right there, you'd have every kind of a dumb, silly, false humility idea that the church is riddled with from one end to the other. Oh yes, Brother Copeland, we're just so unworthy and just so undeserving. I just hope we've been of some little help. Yeah, you know, blame little. Now when you, when you begin to realize, that's not humility at all. Humility is not the beating of yourself down. There's nowhere in the Bible it says to to uh, berate yourself and, and tear yourself down. That's not humility. No, the Bible says you ought not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think soberly as God has given unto every man, every believer, the, the, the uh, measure of faith. I don't, I'm not beating myself down. I don't think of myself more highly than I ought to think, but I think of myself as born again. I think of myself as the righteousness of God. I think of myself as a child of God. I think of myself as baptized in the Holy Ghost. I think of myself as a minister of the gospel. I think of myself as a, as a heaven-bound child of God. You understand? And, but I'm not, I'm not bragging on me. I didn't do any of that. All I did was receive what is mine bought and paid for by the shed blood of Jesus. Are you listening? Now, what it does say is for us to build others up higher than yourself. It didn't say beat yourself down. If you're beating you down, I'm beating we, me down. We both down, brother. See? I mean, <laughs> nothing, nothing to help or edify or to, or to minister to grace to anybody. But if I build you up and I esteem you higher than I do myself, I'm not beating myself down. I'm... I'm thinking to myself soberly as I ought to think as a child of God and, and the things that God has given me, but I build you up and esteem you higher than me. But I know, wait a minute, you're esteeming me higher than you. I'm esteeming you higher than me. We're building one another up, rising up into Him where, 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 the, where there is, it is an uplifting process as we minister to one another. Now, that, that's true humility. 
Bible humility is calling yourself what the Bible calls you rather than what you think about yourself or what you feel about you. Well, I'm just no good and nobody cares anything about me. Well, now that's a lie from hell. Well, there ain't nobody cares anything about me. Don't you talk that way about Jesus. Jesus paid the ultimate price just for you. If you'd been the only human being alive, he'd have done it for you. Now, see, that, that, ain't, that don't work. When the Word of God says that by His stripes ye were healed, then ye call yeself healed. Amen. I don't feel healed. I don't make any difference. The Bible says you are, then praise God, I am. The Bible said uh, that we've been made the righteousness of God. So I call myself the righteousness of God. I don't care whether I feel righteous, look righteous, smell righteous. I don't know how righteousness is supposed to smell, but I, <laughs> that's not the point. If the Word says I've been made the righteousness of God, then I praise God I've been made His righteousness. That is being humble to the Word of God, bowing my knee to the Word, humbling myself to what it says. Now, it says here, be clothed with humility, but it didn't stop there. It's going to tell us what God says humility is. This is where we messed up was by trying to put our own ideas on humility, and right here he says what it is. Now listen to this. Be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Now, then he says exactly what God gives grace to and what God resists, if you just keep reading. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. He didn't say He didn't want you to be exalted. The Word of God doesn't teach that you shouldn't be exalted. The Word of God teaches that you don't have any business exalting you. He said He would exalt you. Now listen. Casting all, A-L-L, -L, all, casting all your care. Over there it said be careful for nothing. Casting all your care on Him for he cares for you. Brother Copeland, I wish you'd pray that God will help me carry half of these burdens. I believe I can carry half of them. That's pride. Pride? Yeah, he said roll all your care over on him. God didn't build you to carry care. God did, didn't create man to be a burden of care. Roll all your care over on him. I mean all of it. Roll it over on him. And then it says that is humility. Father, in the name of Jesus. Well, let me just give you the. Let, let, me, I, uh, let, me, let me tell you about the first time I ever got a hold of it. I heard Kenneth Hagin preach about it and, and um, sharing and read the scripture. Some of the things that I'm sharing with you right now, I heard him say back there over 20 years ago. And I, I went out on a little meeting and. and uh, now, it didn't look like a little meeting to me. There's not any such thing in my eyes as a, as a little meeting in importance. They're, they're all, I don't care if it's just one-on-one, -on -one, that's important. Somebody's life is at stake here. But, and, but, man, I tell you what, it turned out to be little in ways I couldn't afford. And I just, man, it was tough. And God told me to go over there and preach in this particular church, and I did, and got over there, and didn't anybody show up, and, I mean, we, didn't, we, didn't, we did not have a handful. We didn't have five whole people when things started out. And, and I just, oh, man. I mean, I had financial difficulties and problems and everything else, but I'd already promised God I'd never go preach anywhere based on a financial arrangement, and I would never let any, I would never allow anybody to deal with me about finances, how much I have to have and all that. I will not do it. I didn't do it then, and I won't do it yet. I preach because God sent me there and he'll take care of me financially. If you're going to receive offerings from the people, whatever you're going to do, I mean, that's your business. I, I, I'm just, I'm going to follow God. So I got over there and the first offering was $4.25. And it was so little and the pastor knew it. He didn't even want to count it, man. He, I, you know, I, I was watching him. He took the offering containers and dumped them in this sack. He didn't even want to see it because he knew it just wasn't anything. 
and had him come over there and stuff that sack in my pocket. And I got back to my room and counted it as $4.25. I said, Lord, I thought you told me this, this meeting was going to be a turning point in my life and my ministry. I was the only turning point I can see is going in the wrong direction. I've been, boy, I'm in, I'm in sad trouble here, Lord. And I started walking the floor. And I thought, what am I going to do? Cut it, should I put, I mean, you know, uh, dear Lord, I, oh my God. I'm just not but two women showed up at the morning meeting. And, and I, I, I thought, what am I going to do? And I had, you know, four, five, six people in the night meeting. What am I, oh, dear Lord. And if I took out a full page ad on every page in the local paper, they wouldn't know who it was. I'd just be deeper in debt. What am I going to do? Oh, dear God. Oh, dear God. How can I get the word out? I mean, ain't nobody knows who I am anyhow. What am I going to do? I mean, by this time, it's about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm still, what am I going to do? You know? And I mean, it's getting worse. But it's hurting down on the inside of me. It's disturbing me. It's upsetting me. My, and I, and, 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 well, you know what I'm talking about. Boy, your old brain just runs in circles and, you, and there are no answers. And I stopped there a little bit and I kept, it, it, it seemed to me like words down on the inside of me kept trying to float up to the surface. And the words that I kept hearing was uh, 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Casting the whole, well, I put that down. I mean, what does that have to do with anything? I mean, I got a problem here. I ain't got time to go read that. And so I'm, I'm walking up and down the floor. And finally, I got on, on my knees here. I said, Lord, wh oh, what am I going to do here? I, oh, Jesus. And I, I'm, I'm right there next to my bed, you know. And I said, oh, Lord. And I finally thought, I better shut up here. I'm doing all the talking, and I'm the one who don't know nothing. And, and so I stopped. Here you come. First Peter 5, 6, and 7. I thought, well, okay. I walked over there and opened it up, casting the whole of your care. And I remembered what I heard Brother Hagin say about it. And I thought, well, I, the only thing I know how to do about it is just what he did. And so I read that, and I said, Lord, this meeting, here's my care. I care about this meeting. You sent me here to do this. This is my concern. I flipped open my Amplified Bible, and it said, casting all of your cares, your concerns, and it, and it used about four or five different uh, words there. Care, concern, anxieties, and worries once and for all. That was a key line. I said, I'm handing all this care to you. And I looked at that. I clothe myself with this humility that I don't have a care. Now, I didn't say the cares didn't exist. I said I don't have them. I gave them to God. Now, see, if I, if I hand it over, like if this, was the, if this is the keys to my car, and take this, Tim, and I handed this to my brother, see, and then you come home and said, can I borrow your car? Well, you know, I, I mean, I guess you could, but I don't have the keys. You'll have to talk to Tim about it because he's got the keys. See, I didn't say there wasn't any keys. I said, I don't have them. So, I mean, don't talk to me about it. Go talk to Tim about it. I mean, he's the one who got the keys, see. Oh, did you notice how, when I, all I did is just stick my hand out there, and boy, I mean, he just jumped to hand me that back. Why? Because it's mine. You go back to God and say, oh, God, what about it? I mean, he'll hand it right back to you. It's your mess. Don't go, don't go pick it up. I went back over there that next morning. I walked around and praised God that night for about 45 minutes. Thank God I don't have a care. Thank God I don't have a care. And every time my old doubt thoughts had come, I'd cast them down by saying, get, I don't have a care. You don't talk to anybody about that meeting, you go talk to God about it. I don't have a care. If you want to talk about my kids to me, go talk to God. I've rolled all the care of my kids over on him. I don't have a care. I don't have a care. I don't have a care. Thank God I'm carefree. I don't have a care. And to make a long story short, we had the best meeting before that thing was over. I went there to stay three or four days and stayed 21 days. We had church seven days a week for 21 days. And by the end of the first week, there were people standing outside the windows because so, they couldn't get inside this little old church building we were in. 
had a landslide, brother. But the uh, I didn't pay attention whether anybody there or not. I told the Lord, I said, if they don't mind to show up, but them two old women is in there yesterday, they're going to be the preached up as two old women in all of this state because I don't have a care. I've rolled my care over on you, and I'm going to preach whether there's one or 1,000. I'm going to preach the same way, act the same way, look the same way. What did I do? I clothed myself with I don't have a care. That's being humble before God. And God wasn't resisting me. He is helping me and giving me grace in time of need. Father, I pray and ask you to reveal this to people so that they can take charge of their thought life, take charge of their faith life in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for it. Now cast all your care over on God. People say he's irresponsible. No, you are super responsible because you've turned it over to somebody that can handle it. Father, we thank you for this broadcast today. In Jesus' name, amen. We closed yesterday. We're talking about the prayer of committal. We're talking about committing things to God, particularly in our thought life and in our actions in order to walk in the peace of God in the middle of the storm, in order to walk in the things of God and keep the door of faith open. I like the way Brother Hagin says it. Keep the switch of faith turned on. Don't turn the switch of faith off just because of what you see or what you feel. I like what Smith Wigglesworth said, and I've said it for the last 20 years or better. I'm not moved by what I see, and I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm moved only by what I believe, and I believe the Word of the living God. Hallelujah. 1 Peter 5 says, be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and give us grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. He will put you over. He will see to it that you come out the head and not the tail if you'll clothe yourself in humility. Oh, Brother Copeland, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, I'm just so undeserving. I'm just so no good. I'm just a little worm in the dust of life. Well, the bugs are going to get you too, brother. Somebody liable to take you catfishing. If you ain't nothing but a worm, the devil put you on his hook. No, that ain't even what he's talking about. That's not humility at all. In fact, if you won't know what it is, it's Bible ignorance. You know, I'm just, that old boy so humble, you know, he don't even drive a car. Forget that. I, I ain't, I'm not going to take time to get off into that. That's not humility. That's the world's idea of humility. Bible humility is right here. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care. All your worries, concerns, all your, the solicitude in your life, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Be sober about it. Be vigilant to do it, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. How? casting all your care over on God. Don't try to shoulder the burden. Don't try to carry the care. I mean, that's pride. Standing up there saying, well, I guess, you know, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't bother God with the little things. Well, ain't you something? I mean, <laughs> cast all your care over him, on him, for he cares for you. Now, yesterday, when we were talking about this, I was talking about that little meeting I got into back there years ago down in South Texas. And, and uh, Man, I'm telling you, when I say little, I'm talking about little. It, it, there wasn't anybody coming. I didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, the first day, there, you know, we had two women in the morning service, and uh, we had a handful in the service that night. I mean, <laughs> the first offering was $4.25, and I'm walking the floor. I'm in my little room. In fact, I stayed in the pastor's home, and I'm walking the floor. What am I going to do? I mean, I, I, I can't afford to take out newspaper ads. What if I did run a full-page ad on every page of the paper? Wouldn't do any good. I mean, ain't nobody in town knows who I am and could care less. 
I mean, what, what am I going to do? Oh, what am I going to do? And I kept hearing this come up in my spirit. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Well, you know, I ain't got time to read that. Dear God, I got to worry. I, you know, I got to do something here. And, um, and, I, and, and I kept, every time I'd slow down a little bit, I'd hear that. And so I got over on my knees. I said, Lord, show me here what I must do. And, and, and boy, it came up strong again, 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. I said, well, I better check this out. Went over and got my Bible and read it. And then I remembered what Brother Hagin had preached about it and how he described casting the whole of his care over on God and then not touching it with his thought life anymore. Now, you remember 2 Corinthians 10, 5 said casting down imaginations. But then 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter Philippians 4, says to fix our mind on what things are good, true, honest, good report, lovely. If there be any praise, think on these things. So it says cast one thought out and fix your thinking on this other. Now the way to do that is by literally, physically, mentally, and spiritually casting the whole of your care over on God. And I did that. I said this meeting is my care, Father. And I cast the whole of it over on you. I'm not going to touch it with my thought life anymore. I, I'm standing before you in the name of Jesus and I covenant with you that I'm not going to touch it in my thought life anymore. Satan, I resist you in the name of Jesus. You don't bring this thing up to me anymore. Now, I went ahead, went over there the next morning, and I told the Lord, I said, if it's not just those two old ladies that's over there yesterday morning in that morning meeting, I'll tell you right now, they're going to be the preached up as two women in this state because I'm going to, it don't make any difference to me, I'm going to preach the same way whether there's one or a thousand because I don't have a care. I'm just doing what God called me to do. I'm just doing what he said for me to do. I don't have a care. And uh, Brother Hagin said his wife one night, she <laughs> He just, he just refused to worry. He refused to care. He said, I'm not going to do it. I rolled the care of it over on God. It's his problem now. I don't have a care. She said, you wouldn't worry about it if me and both kids fell dead tonight. He said, what do you be used to worrying about it then? What, in other words, what good would it do to worry about it? Worry ain't going to raise you from the dead. Now, boy, that is an outstanding example of walking in this kind of Bible humility, I rolled all that care over on God. Now, we have a promise from God that becomes effective here. This is what's so important. When you do that, let me go back over here to Philippians 4 once again, because the promise is in here, in this verse, be careful for nothing. Roll all your care over on God. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God instead of worry, praise. And, now see, this is a, this is a, a promise connected to you do this, and this will happen. And... The peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Amen. So that promise is involved. And I, boy, I'm telling you, the devil come right back at me and said, they ain't going to do anything. What do you mean? Yeah, what are you going to do? There ain't nobody going to come to those meetings. There ain't nobody knows, knows you. And besides that, you preach all that faith stuff and everything, and you're going to fail. You ain't going to be able to pay your bills. What are you going to do then, big mouth? You've be gone around telling everybody, you know, have faith and word works and God's word too. I said, don't talk to me about it, Mr. Devil. I told you earlier. I told you last night. In that room at 2 o'clock in the morning, I told you last night, I don't have that care. I don't touch that in my thought life. That's not my thought. That's what Kelly told me one time when she was about three years old. I took her by the hand and took her in there, and I said, now, you see that closet, young lady? I told you to clean that up. You get in there and get that mess picked up. And she's standing there, and she looked up at me, and she said, that's not my thought. And I thought, you know, if I can't make her think about that, how can I ever get her to do anything about it? And the Lord began to deal with me. He said, that's what I've been trying to tell you. If the devil can't make you think about it and worry about it, how can he ever get you to get over into unbelief about it? 
I thought, dear God, I'm going to tell him that. And I just told the devil. I said, that's not my thought. I don't touch that thought. No, I rolled to carry this meeting over on God. I was in a meeting one time where the, <laughs> the place where, that I had rented to have the meeting, they'd rented it to me and then decided they didn't want me in there. And they had a contract with me and they're trying to run me off. So every night when we'd show up, they'd have the meeting in a different place on the property. And so one, one and the people couldn't find the meeting. And, I, and, you know, I rolled a care of it over on God, and I'm just preaching like I was at Carnegie Hall or somewhere, you know, man, eight or nine people in there. And this particular night, there were 17 people. And so they had said, and when I showed up, they said, well, now, you're not having, we're having something else in this hall tonight. You're having your meeting over here. And so they <laughs> took me over to where my meeting was, and I got in there, and I'm, I'm in this, I thought, you know, this looks strange, lit, like a, like a living room in somebody's house. Come find out it was. And, and here I am in this room, and here, the, here are these 17 people that come to my big worldwide earth-shaking meeting. And, and you know, they all 17 of them sitting there. And so, boy, the devil said, look, there ain't no use even having a meeting. You ain't got 17 people. Now, hang on to that thought, because this is going to come up important in a minute. And I said, I said, ain't my care, devil. I learned to roll my cares over on the devil from then on before I ever went to the meeting, before I ever got there, before I ever did anything. Just roll the care of it over on God and let him do it and just tell the devil I rolled the care over on God, Mr. Devil. I just, I, I, well, I, I ain't going to touch that in my thought life. You want to talk to somebody about this meeting, go talk to God. It, it's his care, not mine. And so I, was, <laughs> I opened the meeting with prayer. And I'm standing here. It's a nice little room. It's big enough for us, you know. And all of a sudden, the door opened over here about 10 feet away. And here came a guy out the door. I realized then that that's a kitchen back in there. Here comes a guy out the door with this big tray full of jello salads. I'm preaching. I'm standing just like I'm doing now. I mean, I'm, I'm standing, you know, I'm standing there preaching the word of God to all 17,000 of these people. Well, there's 17 or 17, that don't make me in there. I'm preaching the same way because I rolled a care of it over on God. He told me to be there. I'm here. Here came this guy with this tray full of jello. He walks between the people and me. Walk, looked at me, looked at them, and went out the door. I didn't, I didn't even recognize that he was there. I almost didn't see him. It didn't bother me. I'd already rolled my care over on the Lord. Never missed a lick. Just kept on preaching. Just kept on with the word of God. Kept right on going. About 10 minutes later, he come back through and went back in the kitchen. I'm still just preaching, man. Just going. And you know how I am. I can't be still. And... I'm walking around up there preaching. All of a sudden, the door opened again. Here come a guy with two great big things in his hand. He walked right through it. I never saw him. He, they, they, and the people, you know, they don't know what's happening here. And he walked on there. I preached for about an hour and 45 minutes that night. Praise God, never missed. I mean, there was just a trail of people coming back and forth between me and the people. And I never, it just didn't bother me a lick. Prayed for the people when I got through. Had a great time. And, and we just rejoiced. Had a couple of miracles. Had somebody saved. Two or three people baptized in the Holy Ghost. Had a great time. People just coming back and forth. Just making a trail through, the, through, through my meeting. This fella came up to me after that meeting was over with. He said, uh, Brother Copeland and I, he said, you don't know me. But he said, I'll tell you what I have said here tonight and witnessed the beatingest thing I have ever seen in my life. He said, you preached like you was at Madison Square Garden. And he said, uh, he said, it's just a trail of people coming back and forth, back and forth. He said, I don't know how in the world you did it. I said, well, I don't know what you're talking about, brother. I said, it don't make any difference to me. I said, I preach the word. That's what I came to do. I said, I didn't come to watch those people. I don't care what happens. I said, they blow the roof off. It wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't affect me because I've rolled all my care over on the Lord. I mean, they, came, they brought a whole pile full of bills to Smith Wigglesworth one day and said, what are you going to do about these bills? He said, what is this? They said, that's the bills on this meeting. He turned around and threw them right straight up. Just slung bills <laughs> all over everywhere. Now, now, you have to understand, he wasn't being a smart aleck to them. He's protecting his faith. 
by protecting his thought life. He said, go talk to me about these bills. Talk to God about them. I roll the care over on them. Now, don't go acting that way just to be smart aleck to the people you owe money to unless you have honestly rolled all the care of it over on God because you must be a testimony in this because within just a few hours, all the money was there and all those bills were paid because he had actually rolled the care of it over on God. Amen. So this, this man, you know, I told you the devil told me wasn't anybody there. Oh, yes, there was because this man, became an, a very important influence in my life, in this ministry. This man taught me and showed me how, in, 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 oh, in so many different ways, to record our messages with quality and not just old scratchy old junk. He, just so many things that this man taught me. I later on had a, a meeting in his home, and I'll tell you right now, it wasn't no little rinky-dink like this either. But I'll tell you, it was a powerful, powerful thing. And he bought and lives in a home that at one time was one the most famous movie star in the world on that home. And now that home belongs to to one of God's children, praise the Lord, and he turned it into a place of preaching faith, and we had one of the most powerful three-week meetings in his home you ever saw. And the reason why is because of what he saw in that meeting there that day. Amen. So don't tell me there wasn't anybody there. That was a huge meeting because it affected this ministry, and it's still affecting it today. Hallelujah. So you roll all the care, not just part of it, all the care over on God. Roll it over on Him and be sober about it. Be vigilant. Be, in other words, be diligent about it. Now let's go back over and read why he says to be diligent about it. Be so, sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It did not say, because your adversary, the roaring lion, walketh about. No, it says the devil as a roaring lion. He's an imitator. He's not a roaring lion. He's just a noisemaker. The Bible said, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> hey, hallelujah. Roar back. Roar back. Don't pay no attention to him. Just tell him, say, no, Mr. Devil, I've rolled all that care over on God. I rolled the care of raising my children over on God when they were just little ones because I was having difficulty. We were traveling and I would not let loose of my children. I am not going to turn loose of them. They're going with me. I'm going to teach them myself if I have to. I don't know how I was going to do it because you know, I didn't have much education my own self, man. How am I going to do this? But I prayed and rolled the care of it over on God and He provided one miracle right after another for my children. And there were times when it was just all your mind is just all you could do if you just relax for a second your old mind would just scatter like a covey of quail. Just run wild with doubt and unbelief where your children are concerned. And little John, one night we were on a, in a meeting up in West Texas and went in there to get him one morning and his little body was bright red and his skin looked like crepe paper and just the light just just would just tear him apart there's so much pain he's just a little fella you know just just a little bitty boy and i'd pray and it and it'd start getting better and then I, and then it, and there'd be back again and i'd say what is happening here and, and I got upset and concerned about it. And boy, I want you to know the Lord got a hold of me. And he said, you better roll the care of that over on me. And I said, well, what's my problem here? He said, you keep going back and checking on him. You pray and then go look. You pray and then go see. You pray and then go feel. You pray and then go ask. Oh, dear God, Jesus, I said, I, forgive me. I know better than that. I know how to roll the care of uh, my cares over on you. And I went in there and laid hands on John. And I, I've said, in the name of Jesus, as a minister of the gospel, I minister to this boy. And Jesus said, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I said, now, Jesus, here are the hands and there's the sick. I lay my hands on him. And now I roll all the care of the recovery on you because that's what you said. And, and I count this boy as well and healed. And so I went on to bed. I woke up in the middle of the night. And just as I woke up, the thought hit my head. I mean, it hit me just, just like somebody just hollered it at me and said, 
You better go check on John. He may have kicked his cover off. Boy, I swung out my feet. I said, whoa, here, wait a minute. I said, Mr. Devil, I rolled all that care of that boy over on God, and as far as I'm concerned, he's healed, and I'm not going to get up in the middle of the night and go look and see. This is not the prayer of look and see. This is the prayer of faith. You understand that, devil? Somebody said, well, can you ever hear such a thing? A man that won't even go check on his own son. Well, which is more responsible? Go in there and check on him myself and play God or stand by the word of God in faith? Now, if there had been something wrong, God would have dealt with me and that thought wouldn't have come in here in that agitating kind of thing. It would have come up on the inside of me where the Lord would have said something to me on the inside and told me to go in there, I would have gone. Now, this is important, you see. I rolled a care over on him. I'm going to be sober about it. I'm vigilant about it. I said, no, Mr. Devil, I ain't going to check on him. Nope. And I got out of bed and went into the other room in there and to keep from waking glory and them up, took my Bible, and on the way in there, I said, Mr. Devil, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I'm suggest to you right now that you get on out of this out of this apartment, you get on out the door, because I'm going to take this Bible right here and I'm going to cut you up every way but Sunday. This thing is the word, the sword of the spirit, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and I hit you with it in the name of Jesus. My son is healed and well. I didn't even wait to see if he's going to leave. I just tore into him. I mean, I come at him every way. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you're not a roaring lion, and I'm not a whom that you can devour. You ain't devouring me. You understand that? You're not devouring my son with sickness and disease. You understand that? I have rolled the care of that over on God. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, Christ and I hit him with the 91st Psalm. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and I hit him with the 23rd Psalm. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and I hit him with the 6th chapter of Ephesians. Then I mean and I did that and then I said now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth I'm just going to do some praise in here and I praised God for about another 45 minutes. Went on in there and went back to bed and slept like a baby. Got up the next morning and I thought, well, maybe go check on John. I'm not going in there in the name of Jesus. Went on in, got myself ready to have my morning service. And, and, and uh, John got up and came in there, and I turned wouldn't even look at him. No, I'm not going to look and see. And, I, and I'm protecting my faith. I went on to the service. After the service that morning, I, I was talking to somebody about what I'd preached there in that, in, that, in that meeting that morning. And I felt this tug on my bridge. He said, Daddy. I said, don't bother me right now, son. And, I, and I'm talking to him. I felt this tug on my He said, Daddy. I said, son, boy, don't bother me right now. He said, Daddy, look at me. I'm healed. I turned around and looked at him. And I mean, he's just as well. From, I'm from one end of the other. See, I left him in the hands of God. Now, you get a lot of criticism from people off that, but they didn't have, they, where's the critics now? There wasn't a thing in the world wrong with him, and, and we just, I just grabbed him up, and we just praised and rejoiced. What am I doing? I'm protecting my mind and protecting my spirit like we read from Proverbs yesterday. Protect your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the forces of life. Father, we praise you and thank you that we can roll all of our care over on you. I roll all of the care of the finances of this ministry. I roll all of the care of the anointing of God that it takes to break the yoke in the lives of people. I roll all the care of my family. I roll all the care of my life over on you in the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you for accepting all of these things and I'll walk in your peace and I'll walk in your life. Praise God.